show live is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think we need to rethink and recriminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. Good afternoon, tokers and tokets, and welcome. It is Thursday, September 22nd, 2011, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. We have got a jam-packed show for you today, and a quick reminder for those of you listening on the podcast or listening live, uh, we won't have a live show tomorrow on Friday. We also won't have a live show on Monday because we will be going to and returning from Joplin, Missouri, and Boise, Idaho. We got more details on that as we get into the show, but before we get too far along, let's introduce everyone here in the studio in the podcast. Pirates Cove today is our very own Wiz Coleco. How hey, you doing, Coleco? Hey, hey, hey! Pretty good. Glad to be here. No, no claps for me. I'm not worth it. So <laughs> I forgot to do that. It's all good. That's okay. A lot of buttons back there to push. I totally yeah, there's, understand. There's and, a few. There's yeah, a we'll few. just do clap in the studio audience here. Yay, Wiz Coleco! Awesome. Thank you. This is my last show, actually. It's your last show. I got to go back to school, so uh, you know we'll be back later on. Somebody's got to learn that stuff. But we're working on uh, setting you up a studio. Will we do some more uh, Irie Island hours? Perhaps? Absolutely. We're gonna maybe have to take a week off, but. Maybe just that. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. Also joining us today in studio, sitting in the co-host spot, Cannabis Carrie. How you doing, Carrie? I'm doing pretty good. I love to be in studio. Yeah. So uh, we start the show off with uh, Cannabis Carrie and our uh, hemp headlines. What do we got in the news today? Uh, well, today I'm going to go over a veto by Governor Jerry Brown. We'll talk about that. Also, a little tiny town in New Mexico has a few complaints, and that has to do with uh, marijuana. Also, a new poll coming out so showing that uh, we might still have trouble getting legalization passed in California. And one of America's richest men uh, has something to say in Forbes magazine. And if we can fit it in, also, uh, Felipe Calderon also uh, coming out against the U.S. saying, come on, guys. Yeah, and uh, speaking of Mexican presidents, you know, Vincente Fox, the former president, he's going to be at Western Oregon University coming I'm up pretty so soon. so excited. We got the uh, media credentials. We are going to be hooked up. Normal Show Live crew will be there on... Uh Maybe, hopefully, getting an interview, but we'll see. We'll definitely be at the press conference. All right, oh, October twentieth. That's coming up. Uh, news with the uh, former president of Mexico, and you know now the current president of Mexico calling out the Obama administration. You know they got bodies being dumped in their streets, and they'd like to see us do a little bit something more about it. We'll talk about that in the news coming up uh, for today's daily toker tune. It is Groovin' Thursday. John Doe Radio is on the road, I believe. So today I get to take your Groovin' Thursday tune. I'm so happy to bring you this. It's local funk right here from Pete Town, Stump Town, Rip City, Tony Ozier, and the Doo Doo Funk All-Stars. Keep the funk alive, featuring Bootsy Collins. That's right, you get Bootsy Collins on today's show. You can't do much better than that. Also coming up on today's show, it's Cops Say Legalize Drugs Thursday. Every second and fourth Thursday, we speak to members from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Today, we're speaking with Stephen Downing. He's a former Deputy Chief of Police for the Los Angeles Police Department. I'm going to ask him about that new RAND study that says that uh, crime went up when they closed the dispensaries. I'm sure he'll have plenty to say about that. And then joining us at the end of the hour, Tanya Davis, one of my favorite activists, a winner of the Pauline Sabin Award uh, out there in Ohio. Uh, 
she's going to tell us what's going on with the Ohio Medical Marijuana Act, the initiative they're trying to put together. Another roadblock's been put in their way, but uh, knowing Tanya Davis, that's only going to be a minor roadblock, and they'll be back on the way to bringing medical marijuana to the people of Ohio. It's got to happen. We've also got guests in the studio hanging out, a.k.a. Pookie is in the hizzy. How you doing, Pookie? Good to see you. Yeah, she's doing good back there. Also, we got uh, Dan and uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Frank from Moms for Marijuana International. We'll talk a little in hour two about the Idaho Hope Fest that's coming up, and we'll be out there in Boise, Idaho on September 25th. On Saturday, September 24th, I'll be in Joplin, Missouri for their cannabis revival, and we'll bring as much to it to you live as we can. Otherwise, we'll record it. We're right back with the news after this. This is Normal Show Live. The voice of the Marijuana Nation. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the medical marijuana stock exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. Weedmaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit Weedmaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. Inhaling deeply all the sacred smoke. Hey, this is Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger Seeds, TGAgenetics.com, and you're listening to Normal Show Live. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that gives us these precious rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search or seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. Mexican President Felipe Calderon is using his brief time in New York this week to cry out for greater cooperation from the U.S. in the drug war at a time when casualties from that war are being dumped in the streets while the Obama administration's attention is consumed by unrest in the Middle East. At the UN General Assembly on Wednesday, Calderon said, consumer nations must do more to reduce demand. He directed his criticism squarely at the U.S. in remarks two days earlier, blaming the violence in Mexico in part on the fact that the U.S. is the world's largest consumer of illegal drugs. Now in response, the White House pledged to sustain, quote, our historic level of cooperation with Mexico as we work to protect the public health and safety of citizens on both sides of the border. But Calderon's remarks suggest he doesn't think the U.S. is doing enough to recognize and address the problem. The remarks came in August after a deadly arson attack on a Mexican casino that killed more than 50 people. At the time, Calderon declared the U.S. is also responsible for the tragedy that the people of Mexico are living in. The fire was followed by another gruesome incident on Tuesday when suspected drug traffickers dumped 35 bodies on a road in the state of Veracruz. While Obama issued a statement after the casino fire last month condemning the attack and affirming U.S. commitment to fighting the drug war, this week the president was too busy with other pressing international matters to comment. Obama did not mention Mexico in his speech to the U.N. General Assembly on Wednesday, nor did he issue a written statement on the most recent violent incident. Calderon was not on the schedule for a one-on-one meeting with the president in New York, and instead Obama and his advisors were scrambling to head off a Palestinian statehood vote. Now on Monday, Calderon said that his government has been working with the Obama administration 
Association with increased cooperation, but said that a wider debate is needed to address the key issue, which is the American demand for drugs. He said, quote, our neighbor is the largest consumer of drugs in the world, and everybody wants to sell him drugs through our door and our window. Calderon said that demand for drugs in the U.S., as well as the availability of weapons, he claims 85% of weapons seized over the last five years by his government were sold in the United States. Obama administration officials have acknowledged the role that U.S. guns and demand for drugs plays a role in Mexico's battle against cartels, though Obama has said he will not push for a new assault weapons ban. The scandal over a U.S. program that allowed illegal weapons to walk across the border has also raised serious questions in Mexico about the methods the country is using to address the problem. Yeah, that, of course, is a reference to the Operation Fast and Furious. That's a big scandal that's brewing right now where uh, our agents allowed, you know, knowingly allowed these straw purchasers to uh, buy guns in U.S. gun shops while the gun shop owners were complaining about it, saying, hey, you sure about these guys? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Letting those guns be bought and then, like Carrie said, letting them walk, letting them just go uh, to wherever they were going to end up to with the idea that they would trace them back to the big cartels and, you know, make a bust. But as it was, they lost a lot of these guns. It's, it's a really sad story, and if you haven't uh, uh, studied up on it, just Google uh, Operation Fast and Furious to find out what's going on there. Now, as far as uh, Calderon's uh, statement here that America is the largest consumer of drugs, largest drug-consuming uh, country, and that we should do more to reduce demand... How about we do more to satisfy that demand? How about we legalize marijuana so that the people who want it don't have to rely on it being shipped up through Mexico through his front door and open window? We'd be glad to grow it right here in the United States and sell it and and have it you know used by the people right here rather than having it be controlled by the criminals who are dumping 35 bodies on the road during the morning commute. I mean, can you imagine being stuck in traffic behind some truck that stops and then just dumps tortured bodies in front of you on the road as you're getting ready to go to work? This is a, a regular occurrence in Mexico, people, and we have to do more uh, to address this. And the only thing that is logical that recognizes there is a law of supply and demand is to go to legalization. Now, we've talked about this issue before, and here the KRQE News out of New Mexico is picking up this story today. Residents of the tiny town of Rey, New Mexico, are complaining about the smell of a small marijuana grow that happens to be in the center of town. Roy only has about 200 residents, and a greenhouse that holds about 150 medical marijuana plants is located right in the center of town. It is an officially sanctioned medical marijuana grow, but residents say that the smell it produces hovers over the town like a noxious haze. KRQE News interviewed a 68-year-old man who lives directly behind the property and says that it is so hard to deal with the stench every day. Let's go to the video. An Albuquerque man says he's been badgering the city for almost two years to do its job, but he keeps getting the runaround. On special assignment tonight, the street of broken promises. Uh, I want to see about getting my road graded. I've called before, but nothing has ever happened. Nicholas Rios has spent more time on the phone with the city than he cares to think about. This is Mr. Rios. I was just disconnected with uh, one of the ladies there. This is just the latest in a nearly two-year effort to get the one-block stretch of road in front of his house paved. The last time I talked to somebody, they said, Download the KRQE iPhone and iTouch app now. The latest news headlines, videos, weather forecasts. Follow our tweets and local events. Get it today on KRQE.com. New Mexico is a small town out on the hard, high plains in the northeast part of the state. Now, even though it's not nearly what it was during its heyday decades ago, 300 people who love big skies and wide open spaces still call it home. But even most of them agree that there's something about Roy these days that stinks. News 13's Kim Holland is on special assignment. Uh, People are smelling smells from it. It's a smell that has everyone raising their eyebrows and their noses in the air. A potent crop of marijuana being grown in the small town of Roy, east of Wagon Mound. The state's okay with it. This is officially licensed medical marijuana. Currently, 150 plants are growing in this greenhouse and another building on the property. Oh, man, it's hard to, to 
should take that, you know what I mean? This 68-year-old man lives right behind the marijuana grower. He says he deals with the weed stench almost every day. He said, you know, uh, Grandpa, there's a funny smell. Yeah. It smells like skunk. Everybody knows about the marijuana house. We smelled the strong marijuana odor as soon as we stepped out of our car. That's the reason some people, uh, I mean, we live out here, you know, it's uh, kind of, because uh, it's, Clean. We tracked down the grower, Mario Gonzalez, who owns a business called Budding Hope. He says it's harvest time, so the marijuana smell is quite strong. What people are smelling then but is they the are bud? They're smelling the, the, the flower, the bud. Uh, it's similar to uh, wildflowers that you smell in an open field on a certain early morning. Uh, you'll smell it. Residents have had enough, but there's nothing in state law that says that growers have to keep the stink down, but it is best for their safety. The state is concerned about the odor as well, but not as much because the neighbors are complaining, but for criminals who recognize the smell with just one whiff. The health department wants growers to keep the smell down. It's not a requirement, but it's a, a big suggestion. Um, because it's really part of what protects them from other people knowing where they may be. Dominic Zerlo with the Department of Health says his office has never received a complaint about an odor coming from a state grower. But most state-approved marijuana is grown in rural areas, not in the middle of a community like the house in Roy. One of the things that we do look at with the proposals is we do look to see what kind of filtration systems will the producers have. We asked Gonzalez about that. You have different filters on order, you said? We uh, purchased some um, carbon filters that go on the back of the exhaust fans. Do you have any concern that the smell is getting out to the neighbors and maybe that's tipping people off of what you have growing there? We have a, an extensive uh, security system in place. So until the filters are in place, residents will have to put up with the stench penetrating their houses, clothes, and cars. I mean, it's hard to live with it. The state does plan to check out the grower to see if it's still in compliance. Kim Holland, KRQE News 13. There are 25 state-approved marijuana farms in New Mexico, and more than 2,000 medical marijuana users are approved to grow enough for their own consumption. Well, of course, you know, the problem here is that uh, like other other uh, legal products, it can't be regulated and zoned into areas where this might be a, a better fit than a residential neighborhood. Uh, you know, I, I remember growing up in Idaho and we lived near a sugar beet factory. And, you know, you, when you drive into Nampa, Idaho, you smell that smell stench of the, the processed sugar. I know people that live in towns like St. Helens here in Oregon that's near a paper mill. Smells awful. There's got to be a lot of places in the Midwest where you're near feedlots that, you know, it's that smell of cow manure all the time. So in America, you know, we have to deal with the fact that there are some things that are produced that are going to produce some smells along with them. And uh, we should, you know, we got to be uh, cognizant of neighbors not wanting to be around these types of smells. But they also have to recognize that until this is legalized, we are uh, having having to do this any which way we can to, to to provide for sick people. So if you don't like the smell, get on our side. Get on the legalize and regulate side so this can be zoned in a place where uh, legitimate businesses can grow this uh, crop uh, without offending the neighbors. California Governor Jerry Brown was busy with a pen on Wednesday signing 28 measures into law. Among those signed, a law making it easier for California firms to sell wine over the internet, a law that would allow bars to infuse alcohol with fruits and vegetables for use in cocktails and others, but he also used his pen to veto a few that crossed his desk. Wednesday, the governor vetoed a bill that would have barred medical marijuana dispensaries from within 600 feet of homes, saying that it overstepped on the powers of cities and counties that already have the authority to regulate marijuana shops, thanks to a bill he signed earlier. Governor Brown signed the controversial AB 1300 bill, giving towns the authority to ban dispensaries if they so choose. In vetoing the bill that would have barred dispensaries within 600 feet of a school statewide, he wrote, decisions of this kind are best made in cities and counties, not the state capital. Well, all right. I'm glad that uh, Governor Brown came around to uh, vetoing this one. Of course, he signed that AB 1300 that's going to allow towns to ban dispensaries outright. So I guess, you know, whether or not there's a 600 foot uh, uh, abeyance between them and the nearest dispensary really won't matter if, if a town just goes ahead and bans all the dispensaries. But, you know, once again, it just shows you how much reefer madness is infused into this discussion. You know, we're talking about, you know, people that are growing plants and then selling those plants and, and the products products of those plants to other people, uh, adults that uh, want that and have gone through the hoops of seeing a doctor and getting a recommendation for it. 
And yet we treat it as if this place was, you know, selling plutonium, as if we got to keep it away from the kids, as if it were a, you know, a strip club with pole dancers on the outside that are going to, you know, uh, entice the children or, you know, uh, as if it were a liquor store handing out free samples. This is medical marijuana. And, and the way that we are working to get this out to the patients is so much more careful than what is happening currently. You can either have a black market in this where patients and recreational users are going to the parking lots and going to the city parks and getting it from a teenager who doesn't pay taxes, or you can have a safe, regulated system that's well lit, that checks IDs for the young people and makes sure people have their medical recommendations. Let's be smart about this and recognize that medical commerce is here to stay and regulate it like we would any other product. I think we all know what that means. Oh, yeah. Time to let loose for just a quick moment. Just a little bit. We're going to hang out with people here in the studio. When we come back, we've got some local Portland funk for you. Stay tuned. It's 20 after the hour, and we have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Coming to Detroit on October 15th and 16th. That's right. The world's premier medical marijuana competition will be in Motown to celebrate the cannabis economy of the Great Lakes State. It's a two-day expo at Burt's Warehouse Theater, showcasing the movers and shakers of the Michigan medical marijuana industry and the merchandise that makes the machine go. There will be seminars with leaders of the medical marijuana movement, doctors, patients, researchers, growers, dispensary owners, and activists. Plus, high time zone cultivation editors Danny Danko and Nico Escondido will roll into town with the goods on growing Great Ganja. Be there for an amazing Saturday night VIP party featuring top musical performances and special guests. High Times will award the Medical Cannabis Cup for top indicas, sativas, hybrids, concentrates, and edibles entered by Michigan's dispensaries and collectives. Come to Birch Warehouse Theater on October 15 and 16. Visit MedCanCup.com for all the details. Celebrate cannabis in Michigan. Celebrate the resurgence of Detroit. Be part of the growing cannabis community. Normal Show Live is actually live every weekday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern at live.normal.org. Russ Belleville. Yeah, he's a scurvy dog. In today's busy world, we're inundated by advertising for all types of pharmaceuticals that come with a laundry list of potential side effects. Shouldn't you have better medical choices? Natural alternatives to pills pushed by Big Pharma? At Alternative Medical Choices, you could choose natural, safe, and effective alternative therapies that are right for your budget without nasty side effects. Cannabis, or marijuana, has been a legal medicine in the Pacific Northwest since 1998. Our doctors will help determine your qualifications for a medical marijuana recommendation in Oregon, no matter where you live. Our massage therapists will ease your aches and stress with soothing hemp seed oil or cannabis-infused massage salves. We also offer acupuncture, Reiki, and other alternative health therapies. Call Alternative Medical Choices in Portland, Oregon at 503-288-5579 or visit our website at www.altmedchoices.com. We specialize in out-of-state recommendations. That's www.altmedchoices.com or call 503-288-5579. Pop Pass Records! It's time for your daily Toker Tunes, the best in 420-friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. Today we bring you tunes for Groovin' Thursday, our salute to all the dopest beats and killer rhymes that we find in the best of rap, hip-hop, soul, R&B, and funk. If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tunes. All right, this time on Groovin' Thursday, I'm going to take the reins here. John Doe Radio's out right now on road trip, I believe. So uh, I, I, get, I have a great job. I got to admit it. I love what I do here for Normal. And one of the things I get to do is to uh, visit a lot of these cannabis clubs, patient cooperatives, uh, whatever you want to call them. And uh, here in Oregon, I visited one uh, up on Sandy Boulevard. Uh, I forget the name. Compassion Connection 
something like that. I so many names. They all have compassion in there somewhere or a THC acronym. But uh, anyway, I'm at this uh, at this place on Sandy and I'm talking to the bud tender there. Uh, tall fella, tall guy. And uh, we somehow got on the subject of music and then I played bass and he said, oh, I, I played music. And turns out he is a part of this group called Tony Ozier and the Doodoo Funk All-Stars. Now, right there with a name like that, with Doodoo Funk, you sold me. You had me at Doodoo Funk because <laughs> I was in a band called the Hoodoo Snake Doctors. So Doodoo Funk, Hoodoo Snake, I loved it. It turned out just perfect. So he says he's in this funk band that plays out here in Portland, Oregon, and it just says it's a knocked out funk band. And uh, he gave me the CD and he says, hey, you know, play some of this music on your show. I'd be glad to. And uh, we're going to do just that. Uh, they also host a funk jam session here in Portland, Oregon. And I, I kid you not, at the Conga Club, which is at MLK and Albina, which is right near Alternative Medical Choices, right? So, I mean, wow, really? There's a funk jam in my hometown that I've been invited to that's right next to my wife's business. I think I might have to go, so I might turn out there uh, later tonight. Of course, after the uh, Fox GOP debate, of course, which is on at uh, 5.30 Pacific, uh, Governor Gary Johnson has finally been invited. But nevertheless, it's time for some Groovin' Thursday music. We're going to get, get it on here with uh, Tony Ozier and the Doodoo Funk All-Stars. This tune is called Keep the Funk Alive, Extra bonus here featuring Bootsy Collins. That's right, Bootzilla in the house, baby. Coleco, let's kick it. just want to cook for you, Bobble. Yeah. Check it out. We offer you a doo-doo stimulus package. And, uh, money's like manure. It's no good unless you spread it around. Yeah. So we'll be spreading it there. Let me tell you what's on the menu. Just for you, we got 31 flavors. And one for your neighbor. Some red hot love and some belly rubbing, baby. I like mine well done. Put it back in the oven for fun. Some hot love seeping. Uh, got my jingle bells ringing, baby. What I want you to do, uh, get ready for the funky doo doo. Oh, what I need you to do is get ready for some funky doo doo. So come on y'all, let's get on down And if you don't know There's always a poor day When the media comes to town uh, It doesn't matter how your day goes with Cause now you're letting in the goodness Put your one up just to channel it Then bring it to the nose and then you flick it Keep the folk alive. Yeah. 
jam with these guys. Hey, everybody, stay tuned. We've got Stephen Downing coming up from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. He'll be speaking to us. He's a former LAPD Deputy Chief of Police. This is Tony Ozier and the Duty okay. Funk All-Stars. Man, who put it? Okay, everybody put your hands down. <laughs> what me, Bootsy? Just stink, man. What me? Cats just stink. You need a boff. Yeah, that's right. I said a boff. And guys don't poop. Guys fart. Dang! Down arrow. Oh, the chicken arm now! The chicken! You want a copy of that song for your iPod? Check out the Daily Toker tunes at the Stash blog by surfing to stash.normal.org and choosing media and then Toker tunes from the main menu. Ever wonder how often to change your bong water? The most effective method for baking pot brownies? The best destinations for a ganja getaway? How to hide herb in your car? Whether to grow your own? How precisely to legalize it? Or how something as wonderful as marijuana ever got to be illegal in the first place? Finally, you can find all these answers and much more in the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook, featuring 420 things to do when you're stoned. Since 1974, High Times Magazine has covered marijuana in all its aspects and wonders, from cultivation to legalization to the herbs enduring and exalted place in popular culture. Packed with inside information, the official High Times Pot Smokers Handbook rolls all of this collected wisdom together into a single indispensable ganja guide, including an entertaining look at marijuana's history. Profiles of herb-friendly travel destinations and festivals, favorite potluck recipes from the High Times staff, smoking skills, advocacy and activism, essential marijuana movies and songs, profiles of famous cannabis strains, comprehensive growing information, celebrity endorsements, and much more. This is truly, finally, the ultimate guide to green living. Okay, class, repeat after me. Am I free to go, officer? I don't consent to any searches, officer. I wish to speak to my attorney before answering any questions, officer. These three phrases may help your attorney keep your ass out of a jail cell someday. So memorize them and use them. We have found the witch, may we burn, huh? Starfish Designs, makers of the original Gandalf. I'm Radical Russ, and when I want to relax, I always have my 17-inch long original Gandalf from Starfish Designs nearby. The hand-blown borosilicate glass is strong and easy to clean, and the design is sleek and sophisticated. Starfish Designs are available from Bend, Oregon at a glass retailer near you. For locations, call 541-788-GLASS. That's 541-788-4527. One of the most disturbing elements of the war on marijuana is how it's made police the enemy of otherwise law-abiding cannabis consumers. Fortunately, one group of police officers knows firsthand the futility of the drug war and reaches out to the community and to current law enforcement to end our war on drugs through legalization. It's time now to speak to one such officer in our continuing look at law enforcement against prohibition. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the show here. Joining us by telephone, uh, by Skype, actually, is Stephen Downing, a retired LAPD uh, uh, deputy chief of police. And Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. We're glad to have you here. And you have a career that spans a long Thank time in law enforcement. I see here from your you bio that uh, you entered the LAPD in 1960. So uh, how has policing changed since 1960, especially with respect to the war on drugs? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's changed very dy- dynamically. Um, uh, let me jump from 1960 to um, the early 70s. Uh, when we began to smell uh, two little things in our South Central community where I was a commander, uh, two little things called the Crips and the Bloods. And we put a program together to kind of nip it in the bud because it was neighborhood gangs just like we'd experienced on the east side. No big spread, but we wanted to take care of it. About that time, the war on drugs was announced, and the money from the war on drugs 
uh, took this little core of maybe 150, 200 gang members in South Central and gave them the ability to spread across the United States. Los Angeles, as you know, is the birthplace of street gangs in the United States. Uh, we went from those uh, two little gangs, the Bloods and the Crips, now, today, they are uh, 20,000 gangs with 1,000, uh, uh, 20,000 gangs with 1 million members across the United States. And many of those gangs are servicing the cartels who two years ago were in 250 cities in the United States. And today I read a DG, uh, DOJ um, a statistic that the cartels are now in 1,000 cities. So we have 1 million gang members um, and 1,000 cartels in, in our country uh, as a result of the war on drugs yeah. because they wouldn't be here. They wouldn't have the ability to spread like that if it wasn't for drug money. And marijuana accounts for the last statistic I read was 55 to 60 percent of cartel gang terrorist profits. Yeah. So um, that's where we've come in those years. Well, why is it so difficult to get the general population to understand that this rise in gangs, gang membership, gang violence, and cartel violence, for that matter, is directly tied to the prohibition, not to the drugs themselves? When you're out there speaking, how do you break through that for people? The only way that I see to break through it is do exactly what LEAP is doing today. We have uh, several thousand speakers all over the United States trying to get the message out as to how damaging prohibition is. We try to uh, parallel that to uh, the prohibition of alcohol. It was a huge failure. I would encourage everybody to tune into the uh, Burns documentary that's coming up, a uh, five-hour documentary yes. on alcohol prohibition. And all you have to do is look at it and say, replace the word alcohol with drugs, and you've got it. Tiny gangs in neighborhoods prior to alcohol prohibition uh, became uh, the organized crime syndicates uh, that uh, that grew over those years and exist to, to uh, exist today, uh, not with the strength that they were during prohibition, but they've been replaced by a, a greater danger of the cartels. They're, it's financing terrorists and, and gangs across the country. All we can do is educate people, and it would be really nice if we could get uh, our politicians to uh, quit working so hard to get reelected and admit publicly what they admit in private, that this war on drugs is not working. It's cost over a trillion dollars in the last 40 years. And uh, it, it, everything that you see demonstrates that it's a complete and total failure. And it's a huge waste of our law enforcement resource. You know, every drug arrest takes a cop off the street to process the arrestee, to process the uh, evidence and book it and get it in the chain. Uh, and then the evidence has to go to the laboratories. Here last year in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, they were backlogged, I think, close to 3,000 rape kits over a three-year period. They're three years behind. They couldn't get their rape kits uh, tested in the uh, uh, crime labs. Why? Well, <laughs> drugs, drugs come in first. The, the uh, arrestee has got to show up in court, so the proof has got to be there, so the lab has to do their job. So they put together several million dollars to pick up this backlog. More money spent, more officers off the street. It's a bad problem. We have to educate the public. We certainly do, and you're helping to do that. We're speaking with Stephen Downing, a retired deputy chief of police and a former LAPD deputy chief. And uh, another news story that just came out from the Los Angeles area was this report from the Rand Corporation that took a look at crime before and after the closing of so many of those medical marijuana dispensaries, and they found that within a three-block radius, thefts and assaults went up by 59% over that 10 days after the uh, dispensaries were closed. Uh, can you speak to dispensaries and violence, and why can't the police see this data? I mean, they seem to always think dispensaries equal crime when this data seems to show that they reduce crime. I, I did see it, and uh, and I kind of had to chuckle because uh, <clears throat> all the time that, that we've heard these uh, hue and cries, uh, especially with city council, because city councils deal with complaining 
residents. Right. If they see somebody that they don't like the way they look, they'll blame it on a dispensary. Uh, but that doesn't say there's been crime. But Sheriff Baca, he continues to say they're a big problem. At least, uh, at least the chief of police of Los Angeles is now saying, wow, we're going to take a look at that. And he did a recent study and he said, well, you know, crime is worse and robbery is worse at, in, uh, 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 with bank robberies than, than it is with uh, dispensaries. Well, the fact remains that any business that has cash on hand is going to, uh, any business that has uh, cash on hand is going to be uh, open to, to robbery. Liquor stores, for example, uh, liquor stores have a high rate of robbery. But it's interesting that now that they've done this study that they have shown that after they closed these dispensaries, crime went up. And still yet, the city attorney in Los Angeles is uh, attacking this very sophisticated study and he's saying, oh no, it's true, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's false. But he's been throwing out uh, the, the propaganda forever that they're, they're centers for crime and they attract crime and all of that. Now that he's been proven wrong, uh, uh, maybe we'll get a, a step forward on, on what we were talking about a minute ago, education. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> this guy is, uh, he shoots from the hip all the time. And the problem is, is that he's shooting from the hip, but the newspapers and the television and radio are picking up his statements. He's an elected, respected official, and so people believe what he says. Now he's been proven wrong by a, a, a RAND study, and he's scrambling. Well, I hope that the people see that. When I read the, uh, the article in the Los Angeles Times this morning, I said, right on. Now, it was transparent to me. I saw what was going on. I saw his scrambling. Uh, my question is, uh, is the man on the street going to see it and understand it for what it is? Uh, he did the same thing last year when Proposition 19 was running in California. He went down and did this phony driving test on a driving uh, track. He got uh, a newspaper guy and a radio guy to toke up and uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, marijuana impairs your driving. Well, so what's new? We, <laughs> we've always known that marijuana impairs driving. We had in Proposition 19 uh, a, a prohibition uh, to drive under the influence, just like it's been uh, uh, forever and ever. The problem is, is that they're they're now hollering, "Gee, we don't have a test, a field test to to determine whether somebody's impaired or not." Well, they do have a field test, and they've had it for years and years. It's the same test I used when I was a cop on the street. You uh, give them the walk the line, the, you look at their eyes, you look at their the way they can hit their nose with their index finger, and uh, through your questioning, you make a judgment, you make a judgment as to whether they're under the influence or not. Hmm. But as, as time has gone along, we've, we've become so dependent on these easy tests to, to put people in jail, like alcohol today is 0 .08. Well, many people can be 0 .08 and not be under the influence, but we're throwing up roadblocks uh, to get people today, com completely ineffective roadblocks. Mm -hmm. I'm on and on. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, uh, it sounds to me as if you're talking about actually testing someone's impairment. What a novel idea. We love it. Uh, Stephen Downing is a former LAPD deputy chief and a speaker for Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Stephen, we only have about a minute left. Uh, can you give us the websites and contact information if people would like to book you as a speaker? Uh, sure. It's um, it's uh, copsagainstdrugs.com. Um, let me make sure of that. <laughs> yeah, we got copsaylegalizeddrugs.com and yes. leap.cc, L-E-A-P dot C-C. And uh, you got a busy schedule, I'm sure, uh, with a lot of speaking engagements coming up. So uh, we're going to let you go. But thank you so I, much, Stephen, for joining us here. I also want to yeah, uh, ask uh, if, if you're interested in getting me for our new initiative, Regulate Marijuana Like Wine. I'm one yes. of the authors on that, and I'll be happy to uh, speak to that. Yes, we can. Uh, we'll book you again to talk about regulate marijuana like wine. I think that's a great initiative, and uh, we'll find some time to get you on the show uh, in the coming weeks for that. 
You got it. Thanks a lot, Stephen Downing from Leap. We appreciate that. Coming up next, we're speaking with Tanya Davis from Ohio Normal and the latest roadblock on the Ohio Medical Marijuana Initiative. She's also a winner of the Pauline Sabin Award, one of our favorite activists out there in Ohio. So Tanya Davis up next here on Normal Show Live. Stick around. It's tough talking to kids about marijuana, especially if you might be a parent who dabbled a time or two in your youth. So to help you out, get your copy of Dr. Mitch Earlywine's latest book, A Parent's Guide to Marijuana. Dr. Earlywine is an associate professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and an expert on the studies concerning marijuana, its effect on health and society, and the methodology behind the statistics. He is a frequent guest here on our daily audio stash. Dr. Earlywine lays it all out without the propaganda and scare tactics that parents know won't work with teenagers. He presents a rational understanding of cannabis, what it is and what it isn't, and why kids shouldn't be using marijuana. You can order today through Amazon.com or check our links at our blog, stash.normal.org. This is Normal Show Live. As regards to legalization, it's not in the president's vocabulary and it's not in mine. Providing dictionaries to drug czars since 2009. I don't care what you say. That ain't right. I said, that ain't right. That ain't right. I don't care what you say. Yo, what's good? This is Be Real of Cypress Hill chilling on Normal Show Live, legalizing. US VI normal go. Broke down barrier. Herb is medicine to. Broke down barrier. Boost the economy and. Broke down barrier. It's helping other states. Broke down barrier. Cannabis for legalized to. Broke down barrier. Join and speak your voice. Broke down barrier. We gonna change the law. Broke down barrier. We got to educate. Broke down barrier. Yeah, this is Nayora, you know, bigging up USVI normal, working to legalize cannabis, you know, for the whole of the Virgin Islands. USVI normal is a non-profit organization working to legalize cannabis for the use by the industries and responsible adults. Do your part. Join USVI normal. Register to vote. Pass the word. Voice your opinion. You can change the law. Contact us for more information at 340-244-9179. You can also visit our website at www.usvinorml.org. Normal, unlike any other marijuana or drug reform organization, is built from the ground up by grassroots activists. We are the Marijuana Smokers Lobby, and we aren't just anti-prohibition, we're pro-marijuana. Every week, we take some time to talk to the citizens of local normal chapters across the country and around the world, as well as others who are working to make a difference in the fight to end adult marijuana prohibition. In this segment, we call Grassroots Activism. All right, we're on the phone now with Tanya Davis from Miami Valley Normal. How you doing, Tanya? Hi, Russ. How are you? Good. I hope I got all the intros right. Is it still Miami Valley Normal, or have you uh, moved up or changed any uh, titles lately? <laughs> no, I'm I'm a medical marijuana director with Ohio Normal, and I'm on I'm the Midwest director with the Normal Women's Alliance. Oh, okay. So we we have added a little bit to your business card. We're gonna have to get you one of those double folding ones, like Madeline Martinez. Oh, God, my plate overfloweth right now. <laughs> well, I, I I know that you're facing a little bit of difficulty right now because of what's going on with Ohio. I know you've been trying to get signatures for Ohio medical marijuana. Uh, give us an update. What's the latest problem? What's the latest roadblock? Well, it's our attorney general. Um, you know, Ohio is right now being Republican-led. And they're going to try to scrutinize everything and make everything as tough as they can because this is a subject that they don't really want to discuss. Just mm. like House Bill 214, you know, it's being held hostage in the Health Committee yeah. because our, the House is a Republican who don't want to discuss this issue. So what has the Attorney General done as far as your initiative now? Well, the first uh, group, see, there's two different political action committees that are going at this different angles. Uh, the Ohio Alternative Treatment Amendment, um, that's 
one of the groups, and I'm a petitioner for it. Um, they disqualified different packets because of a technicality, so hundreds of signatures wasn't even counted. Oh, really? What was the, What did they say was the technicality they got you on? Well, on the very back of the packet, it says number of electors, which means the number of signatures. Yeah. Obviously, some mistakes on the signatures, so some of our petitioners, not knowing any better, uh, didn't count those. Uh-huh. Okay? And if you don't count those, that disqualifies it. So hundreds of signatures were disqualified. They said there wasn't enough. There was more than enough. It was just packets were disqualified. For, is so this like, hundreds, a, like a uh, typo or something? I mean... Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. And and so you said there was two of these initiatives. What's going on with the other? And the other one was uh, rejected. They submitted enough signatures, but something to do with the wording... Um, our attorney general went through it, and I wish I had it pulled up. I am suffering without any internet right now, so forgive me. No so I can tell you what the problems were, but it was something to do with their summary. Hmm. Okay, so for one initiative, we on the back page of a packet, we have a typo, and that kills a bunch of people's democratic rights. And then on the other initiative, they didn't summarize it right, didn't uh, have the right summary. So that kills a bunch of people's democratic process out there. Uh, It seems like this attorney general just doesn't want to see you guys vote on the issue. You know, it's about time that the, you know, well, Russ, I don't even have access to my uh, Republican state representative. Why is that? I've made five different attempts to uh, meet with him to discuss House Bill 214. And none of my calls have been returned. Mm. So uh, we're speaking with Tanya Davis, uh, activist with uh, Ohio Normal and Miami Valley Normal, the Pauline Sabin Award winner in, in, was it 2010, I believe, wasn't it? Or was it 09? It was 09. 09. And I was featured in the uh, A Normal Life documentary. That's right. We are both co-stars, if if you could say it that way. We're in that uh, Normal Life, although you got a lot more screen time than I did, and, and I'm glad you did because it's a fantastic part. I think it's one of the parts that uh, people are always remarking to me as one of the one of the ones that struck them the most. So uh, if you haven't seen A Normal Life, look that up. Uh, it's, I believe, on, I think it's on Netflix. I'm not sure, but uh, it's out now, and Tanya's a big part of that. And so, so Tanya, with respect to moving forward on these uh, initiatives, how are you seeing the public support of it? I mean, obviously the government doesn't want to see this, but how about the people? Truthfully, I would say 95% of the folks that signed the petitions say that they would much rather be signing for a legalization uh, ballot. Really? So the people want to go farther than even this medical marijuana? Yes, and we're getting ready to resubmit. Uh, we got another over 2,000 some odd signatures that we're getting ready to resubmit any day now. And how about learning from the uh, you know the, these uh, roadblocks that we've experienced? What are you doing to prevent uh, any of these uh, technicalities from cropping up in the future? We're just not repeating the same mistakes over. Well, there you go. <laughs> so everybody, but I mean, all your petition gatherers are getting trained and they know you know what to do, what not to do. Yeah, and, and you know, the problem is being is getting folks to really take this serious. Uh, we need folks that are dedicated to getting out there and and really hitting the pavement and gathering the signatures that we need. Mm. Absolutely. That's what it takes is a, a lot of committed people, uh, dedicated people that want to uh, make this change. And uh, speaking of dedication, you know, Tanya, we I travel all over the country uh, doing all these different events, and I see you at a lot of them, and most recently Seattle Hemp Fest, where we were both backstage with the opportunity to meet uh, Congressman Dennis Kucinich. I was wondering if you got the chance to speak with him and what you learned from the congressman. Uh, I, I did get the chance to meet him for the first time. That was really fun. But no, I haven't had a chance to meet with him yet. Oh, okay. So just a kind of a meet and greet, but not a, a chance to have a conversation? Right. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping to be able to do that. Um, as you know, people need a reason to get involved and to make a difference and to stand up for what's right. I'm really hoping that they will care about me enough, and I'll tell you why. 
seven weeks ago, I was hospitalized, and my blood pressure was sky high, and I wasn't feeling so good, so they did a CAT scan of my brain. They found that I've got massive calcium deposits on my brain. Oh, no. It's like, that's causing damage. Your brain controls everything. Yeah. But they sent me home. They said, Tanya, there's nothing we can do medically for you. Um, but we're going to treat your symptoms, and we're going to make sure that you're comfortable. And that was hard to hear, you know, that medically they can't do anything to break up the calcium deposits. There's too many. And all now they're going to do is just, you know, find out what exactly the damage is going to do. Well, they're worried about my heart because the receptors from your heart control your uh, heartbeat and stuff. Well, now they're worried that my heart's just going to stop. Oh, no. So I am taking this on a very national level. I'm hoping that I can get folks to care about me enough to fight to give me an opportunity to have a fight for my life. And and when they when they tell you that they can't do anything medically and they just want to help you, you know, be more comfortable, what are some of the things they're suggesting or prescribing or thinking they might oh, that prescribe? Would, that would be the narcotics. Yeah. yeah. Um, but see, they can help me medically, and that's what they need to understand. Uh, medical cannabis, the cannabinoids, have been patented by our federal government as neuroprotectants and antioxidants. Mm-hmm. Five diseases that I have be an autoimmune and the fact that my brain needs protected what isn't already damaged. Right. I deserve the right to life and liberty, I believe. I couldn't and I more. believe I deserve that fighting chance. And I think that Obama needs to reopen the investigational new drug program and give me that fighting chance. Here, here. Yeah, there's no reason why that uh, you know that program, the investigational new drug program that uh, you know uh, LV Music is on and Irv Rosenfeld's on, it's not closed. It's just they're not taking applications anymore. Uh, so there's no reason why they couldn't reopen that and have more people involved in the program. And you know you'd be a great candidate for that. So uh, hard to understand why they'd want to refuse that, but. Uh, that, that's prohibition for you. Uh, Tanya, um, we've got to wind things up here. Before we go, I want to give you a chance to, you know, say any of uh, the contacts, uh, websites, or any other final words you'd like to get out. Well, uh, we're having a Miami Valley Normal meeting in Dayton, Ohio, in the Oregon District uh, this coming Sunday. Um, uh, what is it? I think 340... Uh, East 5th Street. It's Blind Bob's uh, Food and uh, Tavern. Uh, we have very good meetings there. Uh, if it's be pretty out, we'll be out on the patio. Just look for the normal banners. Um, I'm on Facebook. This Tanya Davis, Ohio. Uh, you'll be able to find me with a picture with Jack Hare. I saw if that picture. Wanna... It's a beautiful shot. Oh, I love him. And I... And, you know what's wild is the bird and Jack Hare both are, are gone and heaven above. And so I, I just love that picture. Yeah. But we really need you all to stand up and, and just care. Um, I know most people don't get involved unless it directly affects them. So I'm hoping that since y'all know me that it'll directly affect you <laughs> well we hope everyone gets involved check it out uh, mvnormal.org for miami valley normal ohionormal.org for ohio normal and uh if you just want to get in touch with tanya send me an email at stash at normal.org and we'll see what we can do to help you out tanya and uh, good luck and good health to you as and, and stay well we love you i love you too all Bye-bye. right all right, folks, we got to call it a day. Thanks for joining us here for the show. For Cannabis Carry and Wiz Coleco, I'm Radical Russ. We'll be back on Tuesday with more news and interviews you can use for the cannabis community. I'll be in Joplin on Saturday and, well, actually Friday. I fly out tomorrow morning. So I'll be in Joplin Friday and Saturday, and I'll be in Boise, Idaho, back home sweet home on Sunday for the first annual Idaho Hope Fest, Julia Davis Park. I hope I see you there. 
We got to go. Stay tuned for hour two. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. You grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey!